Well, good morning. It's great to be in Brevard, or good afternoon. I want to thank Senator Tom Wright and Representatives Fine and Tyler Soroy for being here and for all the great work they've doing. And I also uh, will recognize people that you'll hear from in a minute. Uh, we got Rob Dale, and then we have Bill and Joan Grotsky. Uh, we'll talk about the efficacy of getting early treatment from COVID-19 with monoclonal antibodies. Uh, in Florida now, we have over 40,000 individuals that have been treated at our 21 state sites uh, throughout the month uh, of August, mostly the last couple weeks of August. Um, and now we're looking at uh, having seen COVID hospital admissions decline by over 20%. Uh, we've seen a reduction in the COVID positive patients um, in hospitals. The census is down and we've seen a reduction in COVID positive symptoms presenting at the emergency department. And the way we look at this is, you know, we've done almost 13 million Floridians uh, have received uh, vaccination. That's well over 70% of adults. And when you start talking about people over 50 and 65, the numbers are much, much higher. Uh, but we also understood that, you know, as we saw a lot of people being admitted to the hospital this summer, um, most of them, of course, you know, had not pri previously been vaccinated. It was also the case that almost none of them, once infected, had, got, had availed themselves of the monoclonal antibodies. And so this is something that's been available since uh, the end of 2020 under an emergency use. It has been used by health systems uh, throughout the state of Florida, but it was not something, it was apparent to us, that this was something that the average person really understood was available to them. And so when we saw that, we said we need to make sure people understand that this is something they can avail themselves of. And not just people, you know, regardless of vaccination status, because we are seeing people who test positive routinely now uh, who have been vaccinated. Now, most of those are mild infections, uh, but even the CDC most recently, they recently pointed out, uh, if you look at the most elderly folks, 75 and above, you are seeing a slight uh, waning of efficacy against hospitalization, uh, even with, with some of the vaccines. And so this is, you gotta have all the tools in the toolbox here. So we were able to uh, talk about it, uh, raise awareness. There was a great feedback. People were like, man, I didn't know that was there. And so we said, you know what? There's a lot going on. Uh, we know we have these centers at different hospitals and all this other stuff, but let's make it more available. So we've been able to do the 21 sites Again, over 40,000 patients as of right now have received treatment, and uh, we're typically doing over 4,000 a day now, which is a which is a really good clip. This site here in Merritt I that we have in Merritt Island um, is in Brevard uh, has done uh, close to 3,500 people, probably more than that as of this night, because they're doing them as we speak. And I think this community in particular, the healthcare uh, folks and everything, have really uh, worked hard to alert people that this is something uh, that they could avail themselves with. And of course, that site's open seven days a week from nine to five. Uh, in this region, uh, Central Florida, we also have uh, one in Ormond Beach in Volusia County, and then of course a Camping World Stadium in Orange County. And if you'd like to find out more information about the treatment locations, you can visit floridahealthcovid19.gov. Uh, to register for treatment at a state site, you can visit patientportalfl.com. Uh, and prior to us setting up these sites, in order to get a monoclonal antibody treatment, you had needed a referral from a physician. Uh, what we have done with the Surgeon General putting in a standing order, you don't necessarily need to have a referral. So you certainly can speak with your physician, and we encourage people to do that. Uh, but it takes away a step, and so if you're somebody that is infected and you, you, you meet the criteria, which are pretty broad, you're able to come in and do it. And so this has been treatment that's been proven to be beneficial to keep people out of the hospital, particularly people that are at higher risk of hospitalization. So folks who are elderly, folks who are overweight, folks who have problems with diabetes, kidney problems, cardiovascular, lung conditions, those types of, of patients can, can really benefit from this. And so we would uh, encourage folks uh, to be able to do. Now you gotta do it early. Uh, this is something where when, when this hits, uh, typically, now, obviously most people recover without a problem, which is good. Most people have relatively asymptomatic or mild infections. Uh, what happens is people produce antibodies, they fight back the, the virus, and then they recover. Well, in some people, particularly the higher risk groups, uh, those antibodies uh, aren't necessarily produced to the extent they need to, so that's what this is providing. With the, we're using Regeneron, but you also have others. It's, it's, it's basically an antibody cocktail. Puts it in, 
and then allows uh, more ammunition uh, in terms of antibodies to fight against uh, the, 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 the virus's progression. Once you get to the point where you're incredibly ill in the ICU, then taking it at that point is likely not to turn it around. And so if you do it early when symptoms are, are onset, um, it has a really good track record of resolving the symptoms. So we have some folks here um, who are talking about, and oh, by the way, uh, we're using the, uh, the Regeneron. It's free for patients. Uh, folks, uh, don't let anyone tell you they're going to charge you 2500 bucks or whatever. It's just not true. And um, it's also the only one that's approved for use as a prophylaxis, and we'll actually hear a story about that. And it's also the only uh, monoclonal that's approved for subcutaneous. And so injections, you can do an IV for an hour, or you can do four shots and, and be done with it. And so that gives you a lot of versatility, allows us to do more. So um, we have Rob Dale here. He was uh, diagnosed with COVID, and he was one. Uh, he was able to utilize the uh, Kiwanis Island Park site uh, here in Brevard County uh, to get his treatment. So, Rob. Hi, I'd like to first take this opportunity to sincerely thank the governor and, and his staff for making the program available, the Regeneron program. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I was diagnosed with COVID. Uh, the next day after diagnosis, we went down. They had just established the program. And for all I know, he and his staff may literally have saved my life and my fiance's life with, with the availability of this. Uh, I've lost family members. I've lost friends during the, the whole COVID uh, issue. And the way that this worked, uh, I was having symptoms, had fever, uh, had heaviness in my chest, uh, probably a little bit of fluid. Uh, we went down, we went and got the treatment. Uh, I was a little concerned. Uh, they talked about four shots, two in the belly. Uh, the belly is always kind of concerned me, kind of a sensitive area, uh, but actually felt nothing, essentially, uh, in, in the belly area. The arms were like uh, regular shots. Uh, we went out, they monitored us for an hour, had no issues. That night uh, was, was probably the worst of it. I won't sugarcoat it. I, I, I did have a little bit of uh, uh, night sweats and, and chills. The next morning, though, uh, essentially, the way I look at it is is the the serum. Uh, I, I actually joke about. It. I call it the the Captain America super serum, and and it actually I had no heaviness in my chest. All my symptoms were gone. My fever was gone. I uh, still had to maintain the the quarantine, and you know that went on for a while. But I, full recovery, and uh, same thing for my fiance. Uh, so I am very thankful for the governor making this program available. Again, I would echo that. I, the first thing out of my mouth, I'm, I'm a financial planner. I, I, I wanted to know how much does it cost. And, and uh, uh, at no cost, it was, it was a no-brainer for me. So. Is she going to talk about it, or you want to talk about the prophylaxis? Michelle, would you like that? Well, uh, I, Michelle, uh, my fiancé, uh, was experiencing... Uh, uh, not not uh, diagnosed with COVID, but uh, she took it as a preventative, uh, which is one of the uh, other uh, reasons to get the, the 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 serum. She has asthma, and we were very concerned about her getting it from me. I mean, we tried to separate ourselves, but you live in the same house, and it doesn't work out that way. But uh, uh, all I know is on January second, I get to marry her because we're we're in. In good shape now, so so I'm I'm very thankful. All right, great job. Okay, Bill and Joan, you come up and talk about uh, yeah. Whoever, whoever wants to be this person, you go. You guys make. Bill and Joan. I'll start. Okay, I'm Joan Grodsky. Um, I'm one of probably the first ones who got the infusion, December 22nd. December 20th, I uh, started experiencing some coughing that became uh, constant coughing. Uh, went to a clinic, got diagnosed with COVID, told to go out the back door, that there was nothing that they could do to help me. Now, I'd like you to know that I did the preventative as far as wearing my mask at all times. I was taking the supplements that were supposed to help me. I did everything that I thought I should to protect me from getting COVID, and we still got it. Um, 
I left there uh, with some inhalers uh, because I do have asthma and I do have heart issues, so I was very frightened with the diagnosis, thinking this is, this is going to be bad news for me. Called my personal physician. He also was unable to help me. Uh, I was told by both, go to the hospital if you get worse. I'm a retired RN. That's the wrong answer for me. <laughs> the answer is, let's do something that we can do now before you get to that point. Because as we all know, our hospital staffs are overworked. They're exhausted. We need to do something to help them also. So um, I was fortunate because my neighbor knew Dr. Todd Husty, who is Seminole County Medical Director. Dr. Husty called me and he said, let me help you. He said, there's something new out there called monoclonal antibody infusion. And he said, Advent Hospital Outpatient Infusion Center is offering it. He was able to get me in within 24 hours. Now, mind you, at that time, then I had a fever of 102.9. I had horrible racking chills and body pain. I was short, short of breath. Um, I got in for the infusion. Within 24 hours, I did miraculous, you know, turnaround. The coughing was barely there. The fever was gone. The pain was gone. Um, I was so relieved because I felt it truly, truly saved my life. And unfortunately, my husband got it <laughs> four days after me. Um, and we are just so thankful that the infusion was available. And it was a little bit different then because we, uh, the infusion took place over an hour, and they watched us for an hour. And for a, a week, they kept track of us on a, an app on our phone. So we had to give our, our vitals and our symptoms and what was going on. And if it didn't look right, they'd call us back right away. So things have definitely progressed in a good way, especially with the sub-Q being available now. So I'd like to turn it over to Bill. And anyway, thank you, Governor. We oh, yeah. truly appreciate what you've done for sure, us. Sure, yes. mm -hmm. uh, I'm Bill Grodsky, and uh, my story mirrors Jones somewhat. Uh, but uh, I am not retired. Um, I work for a national home respiratory company, and my job is the liaison for the Florida Ventilator Center, uh, which is located here in Melbourne. Uh, we provide ventilators for people at home, as well as other respiratory equipment. Uh, so I'm in and out of the hospital, the ICUs, almost daily, seeing patients and evaluating them, as well as their caregivers to see if they're a candidate to go home on a ventilator. I was convinced that I was gonna contract COVID. If I did, it was gonna be from the hospital. However, it was on our little birthday vacation trip out of state where we contracted COVID. I was several days behind her. Fortunately, when I got symptomatic uh, and I went to get tested and was tested positive for COVID, I had already seen what the monoclonal antibody infusion did for her. So I was not gonna let them send me out the back door with uh, 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 directions to go to the hospital if I got worse. Uh, I insisted on a referral for the antibody uh, infusion. Uh, they had to do some research. They made me wait in a little isolated room and they had to look it up and you know, I provided them with all the information I could. Fortunately, the doctor sent me out of there with a referral uh, to Advent Health's uh, infusion center. The next day, she, the doctor told me, don't call them, they will call you. I kind of don't believe that because of my, you know, uh, uh, how, uh, how I operate in the hospitals and the lack of return calls that I get, but, um, they called me right away that evening and said, can you come in first thing in the morning? So the first thing in the morning, uh, got the infusion, and just like Joan, with all the symptoms I had, high fever, extreme fatigue, achiness, um, the next day within 24 hours, I was well on the road to recovery, and within a couple days, I felt completely fine. Still had the loss of taste and smell, which was very frustrating, but um, uh, all in all, um, it was, uh, I felt also that it saved my life. I have an autoimmune issue uh, for which I take uh, immunosuppressive drugs, so uh, I was at high risk for getting worse um, and not having a good outcome. So 
I was I felt truly blessed by uh, getting the infusion, and I am so happy that not only is the general public being uh, informed about this, but hopefully some of the doctors who I know in a lot of cases are still not aware or are not referring patients to these centers. Thank you. Well, well thanks for those uh, testimonials. I mean, we're in a situation where for a long time, the message to people that had contracted COVID was basically, for, from a lot of quarters, just go home and hope you don't get really ill enough to come to the hospital. And our message is, no, if you, if you get COVID, particularly if you're in one of these high-risk groups, the message has got to be, you know, there's early treatment available for you. Again, no one's going to force you to, to do this. This is your choice. You've got to do, talk to your physician, do whatever research you want. Uh, but particularly when you have folks that very well could, could end up progressing to hospitalization, ICU, could even die, uh, getting this early uh, can really make all the difference. And so the days of just saying, uh, go home and, uh, you know, if you get really ill, come, come to go to the hospital. You know, those days are, have got to be over. They're over in Florida. Uh, this is something that's been available, as, as, as you heard Degrosky say, since December of 2020. It has been utilized throughout Florida uh, by a lot of different health systems. However, it was not something uh, that the average person uh, really had a good understanding of, and that was really apparent to us as we started to see these hospital admissions this summer. Now people understand you know, that they do have options to be able to do. And, and of course, early treatment, goals to save lives, first and foremost. And I guarantee you, uh, if you look at those 40,000 folks that got the monoclonal, there's no doubt that some of them would have been hospitalized and some of them would have died if they did not have this. But it's also just the case, most people that get admitted to the hospital do recover and they are discharged. No one wants to go to the hospital. You could prevent that and have a, have a quicker rebound. I mean, that's really important, too. Also, given that the hospitals have had a very busy summer season, still busy, uh, if people can be kept out through this, man, you got to do it. And then, uh, and then even short of that, just being able to be on the mend and get people back. I mean, you know, you have, you know, moms that have to take care of kids. You've got people that run business. You've got all kinds of stuff where this could truncate the illness and really make it something uh, that is much more manageable. And so we're, we're happy to see the response on this. We're obviously really happy to see the decline in, in admissions and the decline in the hospital census and emergency room visits. Um, and we want to keep, keep this going. But the goal is you got to bring every tool in the toolbox out. You know, we've done almost 13 million vaccinations. Uh, that's been... Um, instrumental, I think, in protecting a lot of people from severe illness and hospitalization. At the same time, uh, you got to do more. And I think as we've seen with um, big waves um, in places that have high vaccination rates, uh, this is something that, that we got to take seriously. It's something that, that we've got to do in terms of the treat, treatment angle. So we're doing that here in Florida. And it's interesting. I'll get people now writing into my office from other states who will say, yeah, I had no idea this was there. Someone sent me, you know, my sister sent me a press conference. And then, lo and behold, I got COVID, you know, a week later, and I look, and some of them can't even get it. And there's some states that they have a really tough time finding it. There were some either people said they were going to drive down from the Midwest to come to Florida. They have a house here, potentially good. So you see that, and so I think that we've raised awareness here, and which is obviously what we're planning and trying to do, but also now more people are talking about uh, trying to get early treatment, and I think it's really important. So thank you for, for, the, for, for Rob, and thanks for Bill and Joan uh, for talking. We had uh, some folks down in southwest Florida. Uh, some some really uh, good examples, and then we were in Jacksonville recently. With you may have seen when we first opened that clinic a couple weeks ago, uh, there was a, a woman who was in really bad shape. She's actually on the floor. Someone took a picture of it. It went viral. Uh, she then got the monoclonal antibody treatment uh, within 48 hours. Was on the mend, and now she's she's back at it, and was able to talk about. Uh, the fact that had that not been there, she would have. She was destined for the ICU. So these are really powerful things, and it's really helping people. So we appreciate it. Okay, take some questions, yes, ma'am. Governor, uh, thank you for answering my question. For taking my question, rather, um, do you or the DOE plan to dock pay for Orange County Public Schools? As I'm sure you've heard, they've enacted a mask mandate without allowing an opt out for parents. I know the DOE wrote them a letter, and they have to respond to that by five o'clock tonight. 
DOE plan to dump? Yeah, I think I think the DOE. I mean, obviously, whatever they've done previously with the other folks that um, you know have not followed the law and have not given parents the opt out, I think that they'll probably follow through. I know they're working on that, um, and I know you had a situation um, here in Brevard. It's interesting. Nobody has ruled against uh, anything that we've done yet. I mean, that judge, unless something came out in the last hour, has not actually issued a, a written ruling on that. Of course, we will appeal immediately. We'll seek a stay of that. Uh, but here we are, you know, days later. Uh, we still don't have it. I think part of the reason that we don't have it is it's not an easy opinion to write from a legal perspective. I mean, uh, I think it's going to be something that's going to be very vulnerable to over being overruled. And remember, I always remind people, you know, last year, we had school reopening in Florida. It was so controversial. People were talking about how, how disaster it would be to have kids in school and all this other stuff. We knew the data. We understood. We had looked at what happened in Europe and other places. We knew that this was something that was important for our kids and our parents, um, and so we did. But they sued us on that, too, and they won in, in Tallahassee trial court, and it was not a good ruling, obviously, and that got really strongly reversed. Uh, on appeal. So I think we'll see something similar here, uh, but at the end of the day, you know, just uh, honoring uh, parents' rights and parents making these decisions, you know, I think is, um, is really significant. It's interesting. I mean, think about if, if a different school district banned anyone from wearing a mask to come on campus, what would people who, parents who want to have their kids wear a mask, they probably would go to the Parents' Bill of Rights and they'd probably sue and they'd probably win um, because ultimately that is a parent's decision. So Governor, the parents take away in the face of the judge's decision on Friday, Orange County has a new mask mandate, but they're not the only ones. They're in Brevard, Volusia last night, Orange County has a new mask mandate. Should parents take away this week? This is all ongoing. So I, I would just say, you know, I think there have been some local authorities who have violated the law and have basically taken the decision-making authority out of the hands of parents. And my view is, is that the parents are in the best circumstances to understand because when you're talking about forcing somebody to wear, particularly these really young kids, you know, to wear a mask six, seven, eight hours a day, uh, the parent knows what effects that has on them. The parents in the best situation to know how does that affect their learning, their attention, all these other things. And so that's what Florida law, I think, requires. Um, and clearly, although obviously the vast majority of school districts have, um, uh, have honored Florida law, you, know, you have some you know, you know, that haven't. Uh, but ultimately, uh, when it comes down to uh, students' well-being, I trust the parents uh, more than I trust the government. Governor, it's uh, good news to see the uh, case and hospitalization numbers begin to uh, plateau and decline, but the death numbers have been going up pretty significantly. I wonder if you have any words you'd share with the families that are affected by that? Yeah, I think it's been, I think it's been a rough time. I think there's people that have been infected, or have been affected all across the state, and, um, and I think it's been a really terrible thing, and I think the thing that we're trying to do is say, okay, what was not being done, where was the gap, and the biggest gap was in the early treatment. So I am confident that there are going to be people that are now being availed of this uh, who are going to have better outcomes um, as a result of that. I do look back and I, and I kind of, when the, when the Regeneron came out in December and the Eli Lilly, you know, you look, you didn't hear a big push amongst a lot of our expert class uh, about getting early treatment. I mean, there's a reason why nobody knew, or very few people really knew, um, you know, we knew Florida hospitals were doing it. and. Um, and I think that that would be something that was a that was a big big shortcoming. We saw the shortcoming. We've we've addressed it. Um, but I do feel that um, that it has been something that was just as a matter of course. Uh, you know, I think that there are some people that would have been, been had better outcomes. So I think it's a really uh, really sad thing uh, when you think. Now we have people standing here with us who who may not have been here uh, were not for this treatment. And so we want all hands on deck, and we want to be able uh, to help. But I think that you know, you look beyond. Just, I mean, we see the tools that we have in the, in, in the statistics. You see the folks getting admitted to hospitals, and, and obviously you see it reflected in the mortality. Uh, those tend to be folks who were, were not vaccinated prior to, to being infected, and then they were also folks, by and large, who did not get the monoclonal antibody treatment. So it's my view that if, if the tools that are available are used, you know, and they are being used now, at least with the treatment, you, know, you will see uh, more people uh, be able to handle this, and that's ultimately what it's about, uh, you know, about saving lives. But what happens if the school districts choose not to comply? Well, I think you've seen, so the, uh, I think in Alachua and Broward, the um, Board of Education has uh, uh, withheld salaries from the elected politicians, the, the school board politicians. Um, 
and, and that's something that I think is will probably be in the, in the in the hopper for stuff going forward. And then of course, you know, we'll see what happens with this with this written order, and then see what happens with with the appeal. But I'm uh, very confident that we'll, we'll have an appeal. I think some of them now are saying, well, uh, since you have this judge or whatever, they're saying, well, we we may not have to comply. Well, there's no order in place telling you don't have to comply, and so. Uh, but I think they'll be disabused of that notion very very quickly. Okay, thanks, guys.